you know, every episode, we have to say that this is just a portion of a conversation. We have to edit things down, and we kind of regret that. This episode especially, we could have talked for hours, made a 23-part series. Um, Francis J. Pearson is knowledgeable and has a lifetime of experiences to investigate and to learn from. So our talk could comfortably range from Colorado history, William Gilpin, to the urbanist Jane Jacobs, regional barbecue, uh, many other topics, and of course, maps and his life in cartography. Uh, this episode, Francis J. Pearson. If we were going to describe Francis J. Pearson, I would probably have to start off by say cartographer, author, composer, historian. Yeah, <laughs> Francis yeah, Pearson. <laughs> all, all those things. All those things are uh, indeed niches that you uh, you work in in a lot of different ways and sure. have, have for years and years. Uh, but I suppose the uh, most important one started off was it was uh, Francis the Navigator uh, as a pretty uh, much yeah <laughs> as, yeah as a, as a kid <laughs> yep exactly so uh, you realized early on that the good seat was the uh, spot for the Navigator up front and out of right, a, out of right. a big family uh, you you quickly got the catbird seat fast uh, but it exactly. also required a set of skills mm -hmm. uh, how did uh, how did that kind of come about how did it happen. How did I develop the skills? Yeah. Um, well, you know, growing up in Denver, um, I just, I, I was just curious about, and, and I got, I think I was about 10 years old when my dad, I don't know where he got it, but he got this, it was a two color uh, map with black and white uh, streets. And then it had kind of a blue uh, overlay on it that showed the, I think they were the precincts at the time. Mm. This would have been back in the 1960s. So it must have been a, you know, city and county of Denver. It was probably a precinct map. Uh, anyhow, he got a hold of this thing somewhere, and I, it was about probably about four feet by four feet. It was a pretty good sized map, and I remember hanging that up on the the wall of my room and just being fascinated with that and just studying it. And um, as I as I studied that more and more, and of course I'd always liked maps, so so I think that's probably why he he found this for me because he knew I kind of had a penchant for maps anyway. Uh, but I started studying that, and you know I was really fascinated because there were parts of the city on there that I really didn't know, and I started exploring them on the map, you know, and then uh, uh, so I thought, well, I need to I need to learn these streets, and of course Denver has the uh, uh, the standard universal grid and, and the uh, alphabetical street names. Um, and, you know, that was known as the Maloney system. So a uh, map was on your wall. That becomes a, a reference point, also kind of a right. jumping off point for imagination. Uh, do you do you recall, was it maybe one of the ones by Clayson, or do you remember who the maker was on that map? You know, I don't even remember who it was. I think it was just the city and county of Denver, uh, and they may have had their own drafting department create this map just for their election uh, yeah. precincts. Yep, yep, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm guessing that's who it was. You know, it was the city itself. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, from from that time, there had kind of been a seed germinating in you. Uh, you make it to school. Uh, what? Where did you go to school? What did you pursue? Uh, well. Actually, when I when I got out of high school, I, I graduated from George Washington High School in 1970, and then I started going to uh, University of Colorado Denver (UCD). But we jokingly called it UCLA back in those days because we in the old tramway building down there downtown. So it was it was the University of Colorado between Lawrence and Arapahoe. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Hadn't heard that one. Known as UCLA, right? The UCLA the local makes sense. branch. That makes sense. <laughs> so I, wa I wanted to study architecture uh, ah, because that yeah. was my real first love. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I just went there for a semester, I think. And then I got bored with school because it was all a bunch of just filler classes, sociology and all this garbage I didn't really care anything about. Mm -hmm. So I went ahead and got a job uh, with an architectural firm. I think I worked for the Denver Public Library for a while. And then I got a job with a local architects and planning firm uh, that was in downtown mm -hmm. and was with them for about a year and a half. And, you know, they hired me just kind of as an errand boy, but they, they could see I had some talent because mm -hmm. I showed them some drawings that I had done. I'd taken, you know, when I was at George Washington, I'd taken a lot of uh, drafting classes and that sort of thing. So I was able to do house plans and, you know, oh, that nice. kind of stuff. Nice. 
Yeah. Um, so that that it was able to get me into a into the business, and I did that for a year and a half. And you know, they were saying, well, if you want to really get ahead, you need to go back to school and get some more more training. So I I did. I went back for a year uh, back to an applied science college back in Ohio in Cincinnati that was called Ohio College of Applied Sciences, part of UC. Mm. Um, and when I came back to Denver, this would have been in the spring of 73. I um, wasn't really able to, to find anything in the architectural field, but I had a friend in the repro business because I had been doing a lot of stuff with repro because I had worked at that firm and I was the, mm -hmm. the, the go for go to guy, you know, the gopher boy. And so I, you know, was always taking the blueprints over to the shop and having them printed and all that. So they knew me pretty well. And Jack Kane, it was Kane repro that yeah. knew me real well. Said, if you remember Jack, he was a really nice guy. Yeah. I love Jack. Uh, he said, well, he says, if you're looking for a job, he said, I know a couple of oil companies that are looking, you know, for, for a draftsman. I said, really? That oil and gas, that's different, but you know, I could I could probably do that. So uh, one was City Services and the other one was uh, Depco. And so I went and talked to both of them and ended up going to work for Depco. And that's how I got into the oil and gas. And what then they have you do initially? Doing land drafting. So uh, I wasn't doing geology initially, I was doing all land work, so that was uh, wherever they had acreage, you know, a lot of their stuff was in North Dakota, Wyoming. It was all Rocky Mountain region stuff. Sure. Uh, wherever they had acreage or prospects, and we had to keep these uh, books up to date that showed currently, you know, what the acreage was because the leases are for 10 years and then they expire. So you have to show who owns the acre or who the landowner is, uh, you know, the expiration date of the of the lease and that sort of thing, so that they have constant access. This was before, you know, computerized imagery and everything like that. So everything had to be done by hand. So we had these big land books that township by township, each page was a township and had all 36 sections in there broken down into, you know, 160 and 40 and 80 acre tracks. Mm -hmm. And then we had to scribe inside each one of those little tracks the name of the owner and uh, the date of the lease, the date of the expiration, and if there was any production on it. Mm -hmm. So it was just... You know, a kind of mindless work, but it got it, it got me into that. And it it, it was uh, fine detail stuff. Uh, this very is, fine detail. Yeah. yeah. Now, I'd ask at this point if you could take a look at that image of Bowman's map of New York City. Of New York. Okay. Yeah. And I've got Bowman's map. Uh, I even have a copy of it here. Nice. Um, yeah. When you first saw that, it was through a neighbor that knew, oh gosh, yeah, Francis is always interested in cartography, and he maybe he's seen it, maybe he hasn't. And he shows you Bowman's map of New York City, and what did you think when you first saw it? Wow, I was blown away. <laughs> um, yeah, I had just never seen anything like this. And this was an older version of the Bowman map that was in, in color. Yeah. It was done in the early 1960s, I believe, uh, probably about 62, something like that. Yes, sir. Um, the, the, the edition I have now is a, is a newer edition that was probably around 1980 or something like that. And they actually had cropped it down to it was more of just kind of midtown Manhattan. I don't think it covers quite as much as the original one did. You know, so, yeah, when I, when I saw that, it was I just could not believe it. I could not believe the detail. Did it, I've heard some people talk about when they saw it, it felt like looking at the future. Yeah, that yeah. It, it wasn't just and it wasn't just style, but it was like the, right. that overall content that was like, holy cow, this is where it's going. Yeah, well, except that for me, it was really like looking at the past because because I knew that there was a whole history of these three-dimensional maps going way back, I mean, into the, you know, into the early cartography in the 15th and 16th centuries yes, they were doing this. Exactly right. You know, maps of London. And I, I've got a couple of Bowman maps of a couple of German cities. They're just amazing. Yeah, yeah. I think I've got Cologne and, and I can't remember what other, Dusseldorf, I think it is. Yeah, that, it, that was an interesting instance, too. Of a, I think there was uh, there was this excess. Obviously, Bowman had been working on it during the war years, but I think post-war there was kind of this mm -hmm. glut of engineering skills floating around. Sure. And between right. himself and some assistants, 
they could crank it out. That and the the use of uh, large format cameras in airplanes or in cars. Right. Right. Yeah. The, having the the aerial photography that really had not been um, available to you know uh, 3D cartographers earlier because mm -hmm. you go back to a lot of these. Uh, uh, 3D maps that were done back in the 19th century of American cities as they were developing, and you know they were promotion pieces for the city because a lot of times they were they were showing the city much larger than it really was or more developed than it really was. But you know it was a sales tool. Yeah. And the way those guys did it back then was they just had to go with a sketchbook and walk the town yes. and make sketches and then composite this this incredible map from these sketches. Now, in your state of inspiration from Bowman there's something that you picked up of thought, I could do this at Denver. Um, right. And, and then right. you, how, what was your approach or how did you get that going? Well, that was the first thing that hit me. And I, and I had just come back. That's when I had just started working at Depco. So I'd come back from Ohio, was working, working this first job in the oil and gas industry. I saw the Bowman man said, you know, we need something like this for Denver. So, I actually, in my little apartment down there on Capitol Hill, set up a drafting table, got a, a, a cheap drafting table. I think I took an old table and got four of those, um, you know, those forms they use for pouring concrete. They're circular and they're about 12 inches in diameter. Okay. Yes. I cut, I cut yes. one of those into three foot lengths, four of them, and put this table on top of it and then got a... a a piece of vinyl and put that on top of the table, and that was my drafting surface. <laughs> but you, you, you get started on this by right. hand. Why? I mean, out of you could have went isometric, you could have went exonometric, you could have done perspectival. Right. How did how did you make choices as to how you? Well, were do I it? think I decided on the axonometric because everything was right angles and everything was to exact scale. If you go if you go isometric, that's a thirty sixty. Uh, angle that you're looking at, it, it kind of distorts the, the planimetry, uh, whereas the isometric keeps everything exactly as it is, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah, yeah, indeed. And, and how, did you, uh, how did you start the resourcing of this? Did you had basic map? Did you repeat the, the steps of the forebears and go yes. out and sketch? And, I, I sure and did. Walk? I walked did everything okay. and, and uh, sketched and took photographs, ground photos. And then for the aerial stuff, you yeah. know, you could buy the buy here again by after World War II, everybody was flying aerial photographs. So you could go down to the city and county and, and get aerials, you know, to scale, which was nice because then that gave me the scale, a uh, planimetric scale of all the buildings, the street widths, the alleys, all that sort of thing. Awesome. Um, so you go ahead and get it all sketched out. You chose to do well in '74. I suppose downtown Denver was a lot more. Uh, it was much more centered towards, simpler. yeah, simpler, and much towards the uh, civic center. Uh, it was a lot yes. more closer to the capital than what it is today, or how people think of it. Right, right. Um, on your '74 map, uh, your your mm -hmm. your view, how did you choose coloring? How did how did you how long did it take to do? Also, I should ask. Okay, well, that's <laughs> that's a good question. So I started that. Almost as soon as I got back to Denver and, and got that job, that was in April of 73. I think by May of 73, I had a drafting table set up. I had uh, got some mylar. I had a set of pens and all the tools I would need, ink, because this was all ink on mylar, uh, this, wow. this map. But, of course, before I could put it on mylar, I had to do everything in pencil, and I did that just on uh, the onion skin paper. So I drew the whole thing on onion skin, got all my dimensions and everything, and then laid overlaid the mylar on the onion skin uh, and then was able to do it in ink on the mylar from the pencil version that I had done underneath. So really, in a sense, I did it twice, uh, except for, you know, I didn't do all the details on the, on the pencil version. I just did the outlines mm -hmm. of the shapes. Once I got the shapes, then I could fill in the uh, interior parts with the windows and the, you know, fenestration and that sort of thing. Um, and, and this is where your architectural interest comes out as well, because yes. it's it is down to every window, it's down to every court, right. courtyard, et cetera. It's that high. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> it's a it's a lot of work. Hard hard for I think for a lot of uh, the younger generation to maybe get the whole idea of 
how much would go into doing such a thing and keeping it consistent. Right. It's a lot. Right. Of work. Well, so so yeah, I worked on that from May of seventy three to when I finally got it printed in it was late seventy four, it was the fall, probably about September of seventy four. So yeah, sixteen months that I was working on that. You know, every night. So I was working a regular job during the day and then doing this at night. And so you uh, self-funded and you went ahead and printed out? Yeah. Ab- about how many, do you remember? Oh, yeah, I do. 10,000 of them. Wow. That was way, I was way overconfident. Good gracious. That's amazing. <laughs> how much were you going to sell them for? Oh, uh, boy. Wow. Do you recall? Go back to the economics. That's a tough one. <laughs> at that time, I I think I sold them for a couple of bucks, maybe two or three bucks. It wasn't a lot. And did uh, the folks at Kane, did they actually do the printing or, or who did you use? No, them? no. Uh, Hirschfeld did the oh, printing. Oh, Hirschfeld. That's right. That's the old right. Hirschfeld. That's right. Down there down on uh, Acoma. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. Spear and Acoma. Yeah. So you go through and uh, you spend a whole lot of time, uh, not just walking Denver, but then Dallas and then Houston. Right. And Chicago. And Houston. Yeah. Yep. And so you, you accumulate both sketching as well as uh, photography, I'm assuming, mm-hmm. in all places. Right. Okay. Right. Um, how how does your view of the town change from when you get there to when you leave? In a new city. Yeah. Well, when I leave, I'm pretty exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> You're done. Because <laughs> and, and remember, I'm this is before digital photography too, so yes. I'm having to get rolls of film and take all these. And I did everything in black and white, you know, uh, as far as my photography, just because it was cheaper. Because uh, even then, back then, you know, uh, color film was about twice to three times the cost of, of regular yeah. black and white film. That's right. You know, it was more expensive to develop and process and all that sort of thing. So I did everything in black and white film. Uh, and then I'd also make notes to myself as I was taking pictures. I'd have a little notebook and, you know, note that this alley does this or whatever it does, or mm-hmm. some corner that you couldn't necessarily see from the photograph, but I needed to know about, uh, especially when you get up higher on the buildings and there's parapets and back sets and all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, you want to remind yourself of those things. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was it was fun because I like cities, but it was also exhausting because I'm having to, you know, walk every single one of these towns literally block by block in uh, every corner to every block, I'm taking two or three shots from the angle I know I'm going to do it at, um, you know, and then I have to keep those organized, you know, the way I walk it so that when I get back and process the film, I know where I was. And it's not so just can... chaos. Yeah. Yeah, oh, exactly. Gosh. Exactly. Wow. So it took a lot of a mental organization, you know, and, and, and um, also, you know, in developing those roles of film and, and laying out those uh, uh, photographs to know each one had to kind of go in sequence because if they got mixed up, you know, I was oh, going to have a real problem. Yeah. Where, where is this building again? Yeah, exactly. You know, cause I've just got a, a photo here of a, of a building and I'm, I need to know where it is exactly and have some kind of cross point reference. So when you, when you get through with doing this initial series of bird's eye views for Denver, Dallas, Houston, mm-hmm. Chicago, you go back mm-hmm. and do revision sets. Uh, I know in uh, right. Denver we end up in 82. Were there others after that that you did? Yeah, I think there were. Um, I, I expanded it geographically in the 82 edition uh, to pick up uh, the Auraria campus and uh, at least down to Union Station because the first uh, edition didn't have that. I think I had a couple of little insets, too. Um over towards Larimer for the Federal Square. Triangle. Yeah, Larimer Square. Yeah. Um, but by 82, the city was really starting to fill in. It was starting to grow in those directions. And I thought, you know, I need to I need to expand this geographically just to pick up this and also puts everything in context a little bit better so I don't have these little insets, you know, that you have to deal with. Um, so, And that was kind of a challenge, too, because now I had to actually physically change the size of the, of the map, and it was still on Mylar. Um, and, uh, so at that point, now I'm combining two different technologies. So I've got part of the map, which is being done scribing process and the other part of the map, oh, which is being done drafting process. Oh, okay. 
and and I've got to photographically combine those two together. And of course, we were able to do that in the dark room because we did have the. Uh, I had a great cameraman, and we had a good dark room, and had the techniques that I could by using a series of overlays. Uh, I could combine the two things together without you know any edge lines or anything wow. like that. So it did, literally the later editions did evolve out of the first edition. Yes. Wow, fascinating. Yes. Okay. 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 Um, considering everything that you've been through. Do you think you could repeat the same success you had if you started out today? No, uh, certainly not. Not with the skills that I have, because everything today is is digital. It's computers. Uh, it's you know, and yeah, with with my skill set, no, it probably wouldn't work at all. Now it, that, it wouldn't be a chance. That gets me to the real theme that I wanted to poke at for a moment too was. The elephant in the room for me is you lived through the change from what we can mm -hmm. say is an analog world to a digital world. And Correct. your entire field got gathered up, shaken really hard, and then thrown out and redone. <laughs> it's it basically right. what it what you started out with evaporated. It and then did. became totally. something totally different. How do you look at that now? How do you think of it? Um well, I mean, I'm a Luddite, and I, I'll be the first to admit it. <laughs> um, the old ways are always better. Uh, what, what I liked about it was that I, I, I like to do work where you're actually working on the on the project, what I call hands-on, you know, mm -hmm. feet on the ground. Uh, this this whole digital world is, is too ethereal. It's, it's, it's artificial, if you will. It, it doesn't feel like it's real because – you know, you're just playing with electrons. That's what you're doing. You're not doing anything. As much as he may joke, you can hear how deeply he values the importance of a final product, techniques that anyone can learn to use, and a good hard copy that can endure independently for posterity. Um, thanks so much, Francis. Sincerely. Uh, and thanks for listening. Feel free to contact us with any questions or requests, and we'll catch you next time.